My name is Mary Hesdorfer. I'm a nurse practitioner and the executive director of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. The informational videos, like the one you are currently watching, has been made possible by the generous support of our donors and our sponsors. They have made the commitment to ensure that the work of this foundation continues in the face of this global pandemic. I am very grateful. Please take a moment to note who they are and if possible to thank them for their commitment to the foundation and the community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pritesh Shah. I am the Chief Commercial Officer at Novacure. Novacure was founded 20 years ago with the mission to extend survival in the most aggressive forms of cancer with our innovative therapy tumor treating fields. In May 2019, tumor treating fields was approved in combination with chemotherapy to treat people with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic malignant pleural mesothelioma, the first FDA approved treatment in over 15 years for mesothelioma. Novacure is proud of our treatment, which may help patients live longer, and a proud sponsor of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. Novacure shares MARF's mission to end mesothelioma and the suffering caused by cancer by offering hope, support, education, and innovation. Hi, my name is Joe Bellick, and I'm the founding partner of the Law Offices of Bellick and Fox. We support the mesothelioma community by providing first quality legal representation to mesothelioma patients and their families. During these troubling times, we're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation so they can continue the work that they do every day on behalf of mesothelioma patients and their families. We're continuing to do the work that we do and we support the Mesothelioma Research Foundation in continuing to do their work. Hello, I'm Samantha Devine and I'm a physician assistant at UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. Our program offers the most advanced treatment for patients with mesothelioma. We're proud to support the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation because of the great work they do in raising awareness for this disease. Um, Berkeley, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview today. Um, I know that we're in a, you know, a changing society. Um, so many things are happening around us that what we're attempting to do is really get a handle on, you know, what has been the effect of COVID-19 on the various practices, what adjustments have been made, and what information we need to get across to mesothelioma patients. So, um, Berkeley, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your role um, at, you know, both University of Chicago and as uh, on the board of the uh, foundation. Absolutely. Um, my name is Berkeley Rose. Um, I am the nurse navigator for the mesothelioma program at the University of Chicago. Um, and my role involves essentially navigating our mesothelioma patients' care from the moment we meet them um, and every aspect of their care. And so at the University of Chicago right now, um, in regards to clinical trials, pretty much everything is on hold for right now. Patients who are actively on trials, we are not stopping their treatment. However, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, the risk versus benefit of coming in and risking exposure is being evaluated. Um, luckily, sponsors of clinical trials have been very flexible in understanding uh, and allowing us to utilize telehealth and video and utilizing local phlebotomy and labs in order to mm -hmm. do our toxicity assessments. However, some trials, certain medications are too toxic for us to monitor because all resources are being utilized to help care for patients with COVID-19 in the hospital. So for the majority of trials, things are on hold. For patients coming in who are on active chemotherapy, again, we're evaluating for each patient as to whether or not the risk is and the benefit um, makes sense for them to continue treatment because for certain patients with you know not just mesothelioma but other health conditions in addition to sometimes being immunocompromised is 
significantly, it, it could be fatal if they do contract COVID-19. And so, again, we're just making a decision with patients and having the discussion and taking their perspective into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from a surgical standpoint, are you operating on, now on patients with mesothelioma at your center? We are not doing any surgeries. Um, we're not doing any operations. It is just mm -hmm. too much of a risk. Um, and from the data we've seen, we can't do it right now. Um, and then ventilators and other resources we would be using to manage patients while they're in the hospital, again, are being mobilized and used to help care for COVID-19 patients. So um, again, right now, we're not doing any elective procedures. So how are you finding the conversations with patients and their family members? Um, have they been difficult conversations or have, have been, you really been able to work out risks and benefits and get everybody on the same page? You know, I think, I think a lot of patients and family members, they understand when we have those conversations, they're incredibly challenging. There is, there is no conversation that we have had that hasn't been difficult. And, you know, even though patients understand that doesn't alleviate the stress and anxiety of knowing that, you know, waiting could take away their ability to have surgery in the future. I think, you know, each patient and family member is taking it day by day. And the best way for us to keep them informed and to reduce that stress and anxiety is to communicate with them as transparently as we can about what the capabilities are for us and what things look like in the next few months. So really, in, uh, in other words, you know, well-educated patient and family member, you know, once you have that education, um, you're able to incorporate it and find a way to cope. It's, I think it's not having information is always worse and, uh, you know, really hard to take back control if you don't have the information or don't understand why some decisions are being made. So I think it's great that you're having this, you know, these active conversations with patients. Uh, in terms of coping, um, do you, I know that, you know, your center has been very active in terms of, you know, psychosocial support, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, cancer specialists, are they still functioning and are they still accepting referrals where they do telehealth? Absolutely. Um, our psycho-oncology group is definitely there on board. We need their support more than ever right now. It is, you know, we feel the stress and anxiety that our patients are feeling and it's very hard to understand the fact that, you know, they have mesothelioma, they should be able to get the treatment, they should be able to go on trials, and why is this happening? And so we've definitely provided that support, and we are definitely flexing our telehealth muscles and providing phone visits to and uh, video visits to those that have the capabilities to utilize that. Mm -hmm. That's good, and that, I mean, that certainly has opened up a whole new avenue for patients, and you know, there's a lot of discussion, even though this is all so brand new, that perhaps we're not going to backtrack, that, that perhaps telemedicine is really going to become incorporated into more of the practices, especially with a rare disease where people are coming at a distance. I think that is definitely one positive thing that has come out of this is we're really looking at the different avenues we can take to make things more patient centered and either for our patients uh, who, who cannot travel right now and maybe seeing in the future when we do, you know, have our new normal, whatever that looks like after this, maybe utilizing those functionalities to make things easier for patients. Mm -hmm. And then uh, your role as a, yeah, as a nurse navigator, um, you know, what brought you to this role of mesothelioma? How did you, you know, get involved and, you know, take such an active leadership? So initially I was an inpatient oncology nurse and I really enjoyed getting to know my patients and being part of their treatment and their journey. And I really wanted to be part of the bigger picture and not just when patients were getting treatment in the hospital or not feeling well. And so I looked into different roles and explored what, you know, different areas of oncology I could work in. And so meeting Dr. Kimmler and meeting the, the whole thoracic team at University of Chicago, as well as the peritoneal team, I instantly fell in love and I really enjoy taking care of patients. And it is just, 
you know, some of the most down to earth, wonderful people that I truly enjoy working with and taking care of. And clinical trials is definitely a passion of mine because we, we need better, we need the most novel cutting edge treatments we can provide patients. And so my role at the university is really being about educating patients and taking part in the research and clinical trials and making sure we do, you know, make patient centered treatments and provide, be at the forefront of what we can provide to patients. Now, does your tumor board still meet uh, virtually now with the, with this uh, disease ongoing? We're trying to. Um, it has been hard with radiology because our, particularly our chest radiologists are so involved in helping, right. mm -hmm. you know, in the ER and helping identify COVID cases. So it has been a challenge for particular patients, cases that are more complex that we do need a group discussion. We are communicating via email and, you know, doing phone conferences. Um, but yes, we have been continually discussing cases from a multidisciplinary perspective to our best ability. And then I guess you're working with many of the uh, community physicians to provide care at a local setting. So I guess this is a lot Absolutely. of coordination on your part between patients, community Definitely. doctors, your medical team. So. Right. So uh, that is key. I think, you know, it was good to have already established those relationships and those networks prior to this happening. And I think now that is more important than ever. And I really empower patients to utilize their local team. And we're here for communication. They can reach out to Dr. Kindler or myself. And it actually has worked out very well. Um, it may be for patients where getting treatment makes sense, but not coming to us and getting that locally and having Dr. Kindler help quarterback the plan. That has really been something that has been so important at helping keep patients safe. Um, and I think that utilizing that collegial relationship and network is really important. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, even though we only have one approved regimen in mesothelioma, we do have you know, access to some other drugs that we use, um, you know, not off-label what we use because they've been recommended by some of the larger cancer bodies as well. So I would imagine then that, you know, locally, even if, you know, patients, um, you know, are, are progressing and they are in need of treatment, there are some standard approaches that can be taken uh, by a local medical oncologist, uh, of course, under the guidance and direction of an expert team. Absolutely. And it also depends on, you know, what we see when we run the molecular testing, which again has been um, not as quick as it had been prior to COVID-19, but we're still able to get pdl one testing and get molecular testing to see if those types of therapies that are available within the community do make sense since right now clinical trials are on hold. So, uh, Berkeley, could you tell them a little bit about what, uh, you know, what, these, what this testing involves? So, uh, in other PD words, you know, if we're looking at PDL one and some of the other molecular tests, how do you obtain a molecular test and what, is, what are the results revealed to you at times? Absolutely. So what's involved with the PDL1 testing is our pathology team requests um, slides of, you know, pieces of the tissue that were obtained in a biopsy or during surgery. And those slides are sent in the mail to our institution. And then our team looks at them under the microscope and does various staining, uh, PDL1 being one of them, as well as our other uh, pretty expansive molecular profiling tests that we do called OncoPlus. And what those help do is help direct Dr. Kindler in giving a recommendation for different types of therapies that make sense. Whether, you know, as of right now, um, with COVID-19, clinical trials are on hold, but in an ideal world, helping direct her to the right treatment uh, clinical trial. And right now could mean immunotherapy, um, you know, that they can obtain locally, obviously with the careful monitoring and guidance of our team as well, working with the local oncologist. And so right now with COVID-19, mm -hmm. oh no, right Sorry, now with I was gonna say today. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say today we had a conversation with one of the pharmaceutical companies and they assured us with the immunotherapy drugs that they still have a good, you know, uh, supply and they are able to, uh, to give them to our patients. And if uh, patients have not been approved by insurance, we have other mechanisms to make sure that they're able to get some of these drugs. So 
um, again, you know, having done this testing, I think helps to guide you. Um, is there any uh, certain levels that you look for in pdl one uh, testing in terms of uh, recommending this for patients? Yes, um, usually our pathologists will divide it into low, uh, moderate, and high expression and then give us a percentage. And then depending on that percentage is usually what directs us as to whether or not it makes sense for that patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when they do the molecular test, um, you know, outside of this, you know, this current crisis, how long does it take for you to get the results back? It depends how long uh, it takes to get the slides or the tissue from the outside institution. And so sometimes what happens is patients will go to different places for different opinions. Um, and then the tissue has to go back to the original institution where the biopsy or the surgery took place before coming to us to be reviewed. Um, so that can vary uh, patient by patient. Once we get it, it's in an ideal world without COVID-19, it's pretty quick. It only takes a couple of days. Um, but the longest component is usually waiting for that tissue to eventually get to us. Okay, and uh, this molecular testing is normally covered by insurance? The, well, PDL one takes a couple of days just to backtrack. The full, mm -hmm. the full comprehensive molecular panel can take anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, we mm -hmm. have not had issues with insurance coverage with the molecular panel. If patients have had molecular profiling at another institution, usually that's when we run into trouble where insurance might um, have a question about covering it. But as of right now, we have not had issues with it. Mm -hmm. So this would be more of a precision medicine type of approach then where you're looking to target a specific drug to a, a target that's been identified on this molecular uh, profiling. And oftentimes I would imagine that if you, uh, that if you do get a result, um, there, is a, there is a number of drugs that have been approved and other malignancies that are on the market uh, that you may be able to suggest for a patient based upon this molecular profi profiling. So it's not just PDL1, but there are other drugs and other targets as well. Am I correct? Right, absolutely. We try to prioritize clinical trial treatments, though, above all. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there is something out there available that does make sense, especially right now, then we would recommend that. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Berkeley, this has been very helpful. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today. And I'm sure we'll have more questions as time, you know, travels along. But if you keep us up to date on what's happening at the center, so as we speak to new patients or patients who are seeking treatment, it really helps for us to have that up-to-date information about who's open, who's able to do what, because I know this is a real, this is a moving target right now. And what we speak about today could change tomorrow or the next week. It's, you know, it's very hard to predict where we'll be week to week at this point. Thank you for your time and always happy to be here to answer any questions.